Okay, so the session is being recorded. Linda will put those uh, slides up there uh, soon. Okay, so that is great. And um, so first, <clears throat> I'm going to talk just a little bit. I'm going to give Linda an opportunity to talk. Uh, you guys have an opportunity with the, in the question and answer. You can pose some questions and we'll answer them. And then we'll uh, do a little poll. And this is just how are people doing. So that's the kind of poll that, uh, that we're going to do. And then we'll start doing some work. <clears throat> uh, but you should have your uh, you know, calculators around and be ready to be active learners. Um, we are in the 12th week of 16. And what I'm trying to do is put away enough of these physics concepts so we can really start talking about ultrasound. Uh, I, in fact, ordered a brand new book that I'm going to be using for those lectures. I have some older books uh, that I've used, but I'm always trying to have things better for you. And so that's, uh, that's what I'm working on. And so very soon we're going to start talking about ultrasound um, problems. And that's uh, perhaps my favorite part of this course. We'll be doing that using the physics that we've learned. Um, okay, so uh, we're in the 12th week. Uh, the end is in sight. You all want to hang in there. Uh, we're doing, um, you know, we're doing fine. Uh, Linda, do you have anything you want to add? Oh, no, I think I'm good. Okay, that's great. Then I'm throwing it out open for <clears throat> questions and answers from the group. And either you can speak your mind. Or if you want to, uh, you know, type a little chat thing, Linda will probably see what it says. And uh, some people are joining, but uh, they're not asking questions. I'm going to count to like a beat of five in my head. And if we get some questions, that's great. Oh, there is a question. So Sydney uh, has a uh, question. Please go ahead, Sydney. Um, yeah. Do you know the date of our final uh, right now? Or just I, yet? I, I do. Okay, and in fact, just to answer that very directly, uh, I'm going to ask Linda to do uh, a little bit of work and to share our screen. And Linda does a lot of work. And Sydney, I don't know if that was you asking another question. We'll answer the first one. It was one me. First. I, it was an accident. Okay, <clears throat> and that's fine. <clears throat> so I appreciate you asking the question. Now, Linda, I'm going to ask you to do something. Okay. Can you please go to the uh, COD website and go to the academic calendar. Sure. And, and you can just go to the website and search and search for academic calendar. And um, Linda probably will find it better than I will, but she's searching for uh, academic calendar. And we're going to answer not only um, Sydney's question, but perhaps some other questions as well. Okay, it's there. So click on that then, please. And then scroll down a bit. I'm assuming the final exam schedule. At the bottom of this, yes, there you go. You saw it. It was on the side. I was thinking it was at the bottom. But yeah, click on that. Now, <clears throat> and, and when this comes up, uh, Linda might make this big. I don't know what she will do. She might make this bigger. But you see, we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And our class begins at 6 p.m which means it's between 6 and 6.30, and she's looking for Tuesdays and Thursdays, so she's going to highlight or do something there. So it is this line. Uh, yes, it is that line. Okay, so it is, so, so Sydney, here's your answer. Now, this is available to you, this, this whole thing, and so that is Tuesday. Uh, December 15th, uh, and it's supposed to run from 6 to 7.50. Now, I've got a little bit of an issue. Uh, well, that's what the college says, so I guess that's what we've got. I'll say more about that, but that's the time that we normally meet, and this is the College Unit Page rules. So the VCM, Sydney, and everybody else will have their test on that night. And this class will run, just as COD specified there, from 6 to 7.50 p.m. Now, I have to confirm this, but if you are in a net class, I'm going to target it for that night. Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> because these guys have to take the test that night. It makes sense for you to take that test. If you don't come to this classroom, this Blackboard altar to do it, you'll have tutors and things like that. But this also allows me to say something else. So I'm building upon uh, Sydney's comment. Um, I will accommodate every student. Okay. So every student will be accommodated. So some of you might be thinking, well, yes, but I can't come and take my test on, uh, on, on the 15th. Well, that's, I'm going to say, yeah, that's okay. But here's what you don't do. You don't tell me, and I, I'm going to send an email about this too, but I don't want you to tell me on the 17th, oops, I couldn't be there, and so I'm going to do something else on Christmas Eve. Well, on Christmas Eve, I'm going to be doing something different than proctoring a test. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not going to accommodate you, but all the accommodations will have to be happening before that day. So if you say, well, I have a problem on that day, I'll say, well, that's fine. Work with me, and we will establish some time before that day for you to take the, the test. And I'm going to, you know, send some emails about it. But that's for the net people, the people in this course. And, of course, in this VCM, I will accommodate you as well because I'm an accommodating kind of guy. The accommodation is not going to be in arrears. It's going to be looking closer to Thanksgiving than towards Christmas for that day. Linda, did that make sense, or, or should you explain that better than I did? I think that makes sense. Okay. All right, so Linda thinks that makes sense. And, Sydney, I'm pretending that answered your question. And this piece of paper that Linda dug out tells you when all your finals are. Okay. Uh, now I think I need to lend to start my count again. So I'm going to do, um, I'm, you know, I'm counting. So it's, uh, I'll count to five. And if anybody's got any questions, please throw them out. Well, Linda, I've counted to five. So why don't you, I don't know, stop sharing this uh, screen and let's go back and look at the, um, the PowerPoint slides. Now Linda's idea. Oh wait, we need to do the, we need to do the poll now, don't we, Linda? So can you pull Probably. and find out how they're doing? Okay, give me one second. <clears throat> okay, Linda's probably going to ask you, how are you? Linda will probably give you a content, uh, some guidance for the final. I think she will. You're supposed to be voting on this now. Yes, I will be giving you guys an outline. I just need to actually see the final first. Linda's actually hung out with me enough. She's going to pretty much know what it is without that, but I'll, I'll certainly give her that. She's not going to be surprised at all. Okay, and some people... Okay, well, we're going to kind of call that quits. I'm happy there are some people that are doing okay. Uh, I'm sorry people aren't doing great. Uh, but there are some people who are struggling. Now, if you are struggling, uh, my recommendation for you is go to uh, get some help. And Linda has help times, and I have help times. And my very next help time is after this class at 7.30. I'm there from 7.30 to 8.30. So, you know, that's an opportunity for anyone who wants to, you know, stop by and do this. Now, one thing, though, I want to tell you is this is not easy. Nothing, uh, nothing worthwhile is easy. So if you say, this is kind of hard, well, it, it's supposed to be hard. That's the way it is. Uh, we're trying to understand how things in the world work, and some of that is complicated. Uh, but I'm not saying that we don't have uh, things to help you. We do. Uh, and so seeing Linda or Tom Topol or me, uh, all that stuff is good. Okay, Linda, let's just dive into the next thing. Now. This is Linda's new idea, and I thought it was a good idea, so we're going to try it. Now, we try things, and if they work, we might do them again. If they don't work, um, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. And I think we're going to do this five minutes, but Linda, I want, I'm going to want you, when we launch this, uh, I want you to put up a poll, okay? 
and the poll is going to be um, finished or not finished now. Um, we're going to wait till most people are finished before we go on. But if you say, gee, I don't know how to start. I didn't have a chance to look at the videos that Jim posted, things like that. Well, then you can say, you know, you're finished. But if you're actually trying to work the problem, which I would really encourage you to do, uh, then you uh, might be, uh, you know, still working. So, Linda, the poll is going to be finished or still working. And we're going to use that. You and I, Linda, are going to monitor that before we talk about this. But now I'm going to read this. Now, this is something that if you uh, read, uh, well, I shouldn't say read, if you watched the videos carefully, things like that, you ought to be able to do this. This is certainly open book, open notes. Uh, and we're going to work this together. But I'm going to read the problem now. <clears throat> So here we go. And this kind of uh, takes a whole bunch of things that we've been doing, brings them together. The problem, uh, I think, is pretty doable if you have those things in front of you. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and Linda, maybe after this, too, we'll do the poll of still working or finished. Okay, and Finished might mean I've done everything I can. <clears throat> and then after uh, that, um, I think uh, maybe Linda will poll the people who are here and will say, should we do this again or not? And Linda, you can, you can vote on that too. Okay, here I'm reading. <clears throat> a 15 Newton bucket is to be raised at a constant speed of 50 centimeters per second by a rope. Now, class, it's important you realize that one of those units was Newtons and the other one was centimeters. So you have to think about that as you're working the problem. Now, we have information in this table that Linda has there on this chart. <coughs> this gives you approximate <coughs> breaking strengths. And so this is the thin white string breaks if you do 50 Newtons. And uh, I know that uh, my mother, she was uh, quite a seamstress. She could break a thread like that just with her hands. She was a strong woman. And so that certainly can be done. A clothesline that's made of nylon is 400, 4,000 rather, 4,000 newtons. If you're climbing a mountain, you really want it to be much stronger. And you see it is much stronger, 3 times 10 to the fourth, 6 times 10 to the fourth, and so on. And then we also have a steel cable. OK. Now, the reason I was asking that is that so we have that. So the question is, how many kilograms of cement can be put into this bucket, that's kilograms, without breaking the rope if it is made of? And Linda, we have three here. Let's only do one of these. Let's do the one and one quarter inch Manila climbing rope. This is for mountain climbing. It's down here, and this is a very strong rope. Okay, so everybody, um, uh, and, and and so everybody, uh, you know, maybe get started on this. Linda's going to throw up a pole, and uh, in a way, in and either you know, either you're finished or you're still working. And Linda thought of different things. That's all fine. Hey, somebody's making progress because they're not finished yet, but they're making progress. That's good.
Linda, they can change their votes too, can't they? They can. Okay, so so if somebody you know works for a while and then they say, well, now I'm finished because I couldn't go any further. Okay, Linda, why don't we, um, or I don't know, Linda, how long has it been? Uh, about two minutes. Oh, really? Okay. I'm going to let you, you know, make a call on this, Linda, just because I lost track of what time it was. Oh, someone's finished. That's good. All right, I'd say it's pretty much time to call it. Okay. And Linda, at the end of this, let's ask if people how people feel about the warm-up exercise. You know, yes or no, if they uh, thought that was useful. I, I know I have some opinions. We'll see. Okay, Linda, uh, I may ask you to remember some of these numbers, but I think I can remember them. One thing that was important uh, in the problem was this was a 15 newton bucket and it says we're raising it at a constant speed by a rope and the rope is um this one here that goes that much before it breaks and uh the question was how many kilograms of cement can you put in the bucket without breaking the rope okay so uh linda go to the next slide if you will Okay, so now I'm going to draw what we've referred to as a free body diagram. So here is your bucket. And the bucket is being raised by this rope, like that. And um, so let's talk about the forces that happen. And we are putting some coal in here. We're putting some coal in this bucket. We want to know how many kilograms of coal can we put there. Now, this is, this rope is uh, pulling this up, but it's at a constant velocity. Now, I'm not going to do a pull here, 
But if the velocity is constant, the acceleration is zero. So you see, we're not accelerating that bucket. We're just moving it up at a constant velocity. So the acceleration that we're going up is zero. And the strength of this bucket is six times 10 to the fourth Newtons. That means that this breaks whenever that happens. Now, so we have 6 times 10 to the 4th going up. And going down, we have the bucket. Um, and so let's just do, that's just going to represent the bucket. Now going down, we have two things. We have the mass of the coal times 9.8. That is meters per second squared. And that's the amount of kilograms of coal we can put in. And then the bucket also itself weighs 50 newtons. So you see this is going to break whenever we have this downward force being. Uh, the bucket was 15 newtons. 15 newtons. Thank you, Linda. I'll change that. Oops. I got it. I guess the way I change it is here. That is 15 newtons. Thank you, Linda. Good contribution. Okay. Um, you have to tell me what you're doing there and how you're doing it. But that's okay. Molly has a question first. Now, Molly, I, I am going to recognize you in just a minute. But you see, we're trying to say, when does this rope break? Go ahead, Molly. Can you explain the image to the right again where where the upward and the downward. Can you just explain that to me one more time? Sure. Um, okay. You got this bucket and you're pulling it up. But we're looking at the forces. So you're pulling it up, but you're not pulling it up with any force, but we know that the rope will break if the downward force is more than 6 times 10 to the 4th. And you said to the right, so I'm over here. So I'm saying, okay, when is this downward force more than this? And you see, that's the tension. That's what we use in the book. Uh, that's the tension on the rope. It's going to be that uh, when that's the biggest the tension can ever be on the rope, or the rope will break. And Molly, uh, and, and then going down, you got the weight of the bucket. And the weight of the coal. Now that was my shot at explaining it and Molly I, I really do want to answer your question not only your question but anybody's question. Um, are you good with that now or you have a follow-on question? I'm good with that. I'm just looking side by side with the problem. Where did you get 9.80? Because I know that's the acceleration due to gravity. That's G. That's something that we've talked about in, you know, um, some of our problems and so on and so forth and some okay. of the videos. So the acceleration okay. due to gravity is 9.8 meters. And in the low stakes assessment that you guys are working on, uh, you have to change that to feet and that's going to be 32 feet per second. So Molly, you okay now? Yes, thank you. All right, so I'm going to set these two things equal and just solve for that. Now, both of them are Newtons. Everything is Newtons here because this is a kilogram meters per second squared. That's a Newton. This is Newton. That's Newton. So I'm not going to worry about that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this equation. Okay. He said, how much cold can you put in there? So I'm going to say 6 times 10 to the fourth. is equal to is going to be 15 plus m 
times 9.8. So this is an equation that we have to solve, and we're solving it for m. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 15 from both sides. And so after I do that, I'm going to have m. I'm going to put the 9.8 over here just because that's more what math people do is equal to. And Linda, what happens when you subtract 16 or 15 rather from uh, this side? What do you have? 59,985. Okay, I hope everybody sees how that happened. And then we want to know about m. So we're going to say m is equal to, we're going to divide that number by 9.8. And Linda, what do you get when you do that? 6,120.9. So that's going to be kilograms. So that's how much, how many kilograms of coal to put in that bucket without this breaking. Uh, but if you put more than that, it will likely break. And that would be a problem. Now, um, I want to throw this open and ask if there are questions on this problem. OK. That's, uh, that's good. Oh, wait, someone does have a question. Hey, Paula. Um, okay, so we, um, she was asking about the units. How do the units work? Okay, so we will do, uh, we will do that. Now, everything here is newtons, okay? So on this side, you have 6 times 10 to the fourth. That's newtons. But newtons are kilogram. meter per second squared. And even after you subtract off this 15, that was Newton's too. So you have kilogram meters per second squared. Now we're going to divide by 9.8. I am going to finish, Paula. Thank you. I, I, I do see you see it. But I'm going to divide that by 9.8. But that is going to be meters per second squared. So you see the meters per second squared will cancel with those meters per second squared. And the answer uh, that Linda told me is going to be in kilograms. So this is kilograms down here. Okay, any other questions? Okay, that's um, that's good. Uh, let's um, let's go to the next slide then, Linda. Okay. I'm going to read the problem and then we'll talk a little bit about it. And it is important that you read the problems carefully and think about them and so on and so forth. So a stretchy silk of a certain kind of spider has a force constant of. Now this number here is um, 1.10, that is milli newtons per centimeter. We do have to be concerned about our units, but that's what we have for units there. The spider whose mass is 15 um, milligrams has attached itself to a branch as shown. So here's the picture. So you see the spiders weaving a web like this, and they're dropping down here. So there are three strands then that the spider is making, and this is span A, strand A, this is strand B, and that is strand C. Now this angle right here, and they make it look like that's a 90 degree angle, that's not what that means. It means the angle between A and this dotted line is 30 degrees. This angle is 70 degrees, okay? So if you think about this, this spider here, is being supported by strand A and strand B. 
and he is in he or she i have no idea about spiders but anyway this spider is in um equilibrium okay it's no acceleration is happening so everything is in equilibrium so what happens is you have to be balanced the up and downs and the side to sides so it asks us to calculate the tension in each of the three strands and also the distance each strand is stretched beyond its normal length now this is a good problem and i chose this because this goes over two things that we discussed in the videos okay so i'm not going to have you work on this and and again working on these problems can take a long time that's the reason i give you like one low stakes assessment a week just so you have enough time to do it let's go to the uh, next slide please linda okay now let's talk a little bit about the setup so we have some forces here the tension on a the tension on b and the tension on c and they're directed along a b and c respectively okay now the tension on c is going to be the mass of the spider times g now this is the acceleration due to gravity and Molly, I think it was you that were asking this question, and if not, I apologize. Somebody was asking a question about G, and I told you that G was 9.8 meters per second squared. So there it is. And this is what a spider, yeah, okay, good. Uh, and, and I hope this is making sense to you now. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's G, the acceleration, and that's, and Linda, I think this is hard if we go back, but let's just recreate a little bit of this. Okay, so here was, we had a strand. I think this one was called A. Yep, and that had 30 degrees. Okay, and this one had B. I might end up. And that was 70 early. degrees. And that was 70 degrees. And uh, I guess we can do that. Maybe we can. I will try to do that. This is the dotted line. It's perpendicular. So Linda said that this was 30 degrees. And the other one was 70 degrees. So that is 30 degrees down here. This is 70 degrees over here. But the spider was hanging down here, so this was the spider. Eight legs? Yeah. Okay, so those are those are all legs. So that's the spider <laughs> hanging down there, and this was called C. Now, going back to what we were saying then, okay. So the tension on C, one of the things we have to know is, well, what's the tension on C? Well, it's going to be mass times acceleration. It's the mass of the spider times the acceleration due to gravity. But people that are working this problem are realizing that, oh, the mass of the spider was 15 milligrams. So they had to change 15, or was it 15 or 1.5, Linda? I don't remember. It was 15 milligrams. Okay, so this then is if you change that to kilograms. You see the reason they're changing it to kilograms is because this is going to be kilogram meter per second squared. So if you do all that multiplying with those units, you will get newtons. And you find that this is 1.47 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. Uh, and that was the uh, weight of the spider going down. So you see, we found out what C is, and that is what is happening, the tension along C. I want to pause there and make sure everybody is good with that. Okay, I'm, I'm taking that to be good. All right, so we've figured out what, what the C thing is. And by the way, that is 1.47 times 10 to the minus 4 down. Straight down. Okay, so that's good. That's what's happening there. And now what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what happens with these uh, with these others. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. A the tension on A is over here. But this is a right triangle like this. So the thing that's pulling up on A is going to be the tension on A. 
and <clears throat> excuse me and so the 30 degree angle is down here that means that this is a 70 and so uh, what happens here is we're going to be able to figure out what that is 70 and, tw and, and 20 uh, um, 70 and let's see 30 and where did I get a 70 oh 30 this is a 60 okay up here okay so what I can do then is I can say the summation of the forces in the x direction have to be equal to zero. That means that here, um, so I'm going to draw this out just a little bit. So that means that this thing in that x direction has to be the same as this one going in this direction. Okay. So that means they have to be net because nothing is going on in the x direction. There's nothing going on back and forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that TA times the cosine of, and we could call this um, 60. Okay, because and again, that's going to be a negative number. This one going to the left has to be the same as going to the uh, right, and, and we will have a negative there. So we're going to solve for TB, and we'll get that TB is equal to um, this. Okay, now we know what these numbers are, so we now know that there's a relationship between TB and um, TA. Uh, and in fact, uh, Linda, can you uh, do this for us just so we have this? This is going to be TB is equal to, and what we want to know is uh, 2 times this ratio, Linda, and I'm going to put TA here. Okay, give me one second course. I hope I'm right. getting negative 1.06. Okay. Okay. Now we have to talk about the y's. Well, you see, you got a y going up over here. I mean, you have this 1.47 times 10 to the minus 4 pulling down. But pulling up, you've got a contribution here from the a side. And you also have a contribution here from the b side. And again, nothing is accelerating, so there has to be equilibrium here. And so we set up this equation, and we end up with. Um, uh, this and we can solve that we're setting you see we're setting the ta times sine of 20 that's what's going up here from this component from the b we have this part that's going up there and the sum of those two has to be the difference between the mass of the spider and gravity so you see that's going to net to be zero so we can solve that for TA. You see TA is the only variable that we have there. We know what everything else is. We get that TA is this. So Linda, I'm going to ask you to multiply that number times your minus 1.06, and that will tell us that uh, what TB is. And that would I be negative 0.149. Okay, but the tension then is going to be this one. You see it's pulling in the opposite direction. Uh, did you say 1.49? Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, and it has to be, we have to worry about units. Let's see, we were taking this TA 106. 106. Okay. Did you include the two also? Well, the two is already taken care of, right? Yeah, I mean, if you if you took the two times that, you already did. Yeah. Which I think you did. 
Okay, well, that's certainly the, you know, the way we, uh, we uh, approach this. I think rather than trying to debug this right now, what I'm going to do is I will, uh, I will publish a solution for you guys, and I'll put it in, um, uh, in Blackboard, and we'll clean up these, uh, these numbers. And I don't know what happened uh, uh, where um, w with that, uh, but what we were doing should have come out this way. And the number we were talking about was quite different than that, so I'm going to check on that. Now, um, now we have to worry about how do these things stretch, and that talks about Hooke's law. And we talked about that in the video. So uh, F is equal to K times X. And so we would be able to, we know what all these Fs are. And so, and we know, uh, and we can figure out what K is uh, by the information. So we figure out K, uh, what K is. We can figure out how much each of these stretches. I think I'm going to have to clean that uh, up because these numbers didn't match with what uh, with what we had. So I'm going to uh, I will provide that uh, next time because uh, anyway, let's go to the next slide, Linda. And Linda, make a note to remind me to do that just so I I can. Okay, let's go okay. to the next one. Uh, and LSA 12 is in the video. You should look at it. That's going to be due a week from tonight. And so that means it's going to be due on tonight's Tuesday, right, Linda? So yes. It's going to be due on Thursday. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> maybe you're happy that we're leaving that chapter because that chapter was all about force. But what you're going to see as we go forward, that force is part of what we define as energy. So the rest of this is maybe going to be a little bit more of a standard lecture. And again, I am watching what time it is. We're doing fine. I am reading to you a bit, and this is from our textbook of record. Okay, so energy is an important thing, but it's hard to uh, define, except we will have an equation, so that will be okay. We can think of energy as a measure of a system's ability to interact with and change its surroundings. Okay. Um, and, and we can say that, gee, if a nut falls from a tree and strikes me in the head, it doesn't hurt me very much. But if a brick is dropped from the same tree, it's another matter. So you say, wow, maybe energy has something to do with mass, and we'll see that it does. Um, and also we will be talking in this chapter about conservation of energy. And conservation of energy states that the total energy in any isolated system is a constant. We'll do a lot of examples with this as we go forward. Okay, so energy, uh, we haven't defined it yet, but we're going to talk about it. There is a conservation of energy, and we did talk about it is a measure of a system's ability to interact with and change its surroundings. And we also said that probably the more mass there is, the more um, energy something might have. So, Linda, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is an equation you do want to know, and this is called kinetic energy. And the word kinetic, I think, comes from Greek, but it means motion. So this is energy of motion. So here we go. An object of mass m moving with a speed v has, and by the way, this is speed, not a vector v, so this is just speed v, has an an intrinsic energy of motion called kinetic energy, often denoted by capital K, and K is equal to one half m v squared. Now, and uh, I think Paula's uh, out there. She made a comment earlier about units. We're going to talk about these units just a little bit. What are the units of kinetic energy? Well, okay, so here we go. One half is just one half. But mass, what's the unit of mass? The mass is kilograms. So it's kilograms. And this is velocity squared. Now, velocity is meters per second. Okay. And so uh, what happens here, this is going to be a uh, meter per second. But that V is squared. So that is squared and that is squared. Now I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit and say that this is a kilogram meter per second squared. 
Now this, what I've written here, is not the same as this because I need another meter here. So I'll put a meter there. And now it's the same thing. But this we know and love, this is a Newton. So you see energy is a Newton meter. Now they also call it a joule. And this guy's, there, there was a guy named Joule, and so the J stands for Joule. The thing that you should remember, uh, and I, the book doesn't say it right here, but I did, a Joule is a Newton meter. And I don't know how far we'll get tonight, but if we get to talking about work, we'll see that work is also a Newton meter. And that means the ability to do work is energy. Okay, some notes. K is a scalar, and even though they haven't proved this, K can be transformed from other forms of energy and into other for, uh, and into other forms of energy. So you see, we can change uh, the motion of something. Uh, now, Sydney has a comment here. Go ahead, please, Sydney. Um, can you just can you tell me what a scalar is again? Not a vector. It, it's a number. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go to the next chart, please, uh, Linda. And here they're talking about that energy can change. So you see the sun is giving you heat energy. And so that's the energy in the sunlight. And then the plants suck that up and they grow. And then people eat the plants. And those will be called calories. Calories is a unit of energy also. And then you can use those calories that you um, consume to um, uh, lift weights and things like that. And uh, the, it goes on, too, because then you can do more work with that. So energy can be transformed, and um, that's one of the uh, you know mysteries of life, I guess. Let's go to the next chart, please, Linda. Now, we're going to talk mostly about mechanical energy. So that's going to be uh, energy of motion, which is kinetic energy, interposition, which is going to be gravitational potential energy, and uh, deformation of objects. We'll talk about all those. And mechanical energy is usually conserved. And we'll talk about this as we go forward. Linda, go ahead and advance the slide, please. OK. Um, so we're going to talk now. We've talked already about kinetic energy. But we also can talk about potential energy. There's two kinds of potential energy. There's elastic potential energy, and there's also gravitational potential energy. And that would be uh, energy that's stored as a result of the position. OK, let's go to the next chart, Linda, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, this is called elastic potential energy. Because you see this guy or girl, I can't tell who it is, uh, but they got a rock and they put it in this slingshot and they stretched this out. Now, they stretched this, so that is deformation, that is elastic potential energy. Now, this is potential energy because nothing has happened yet. But if this guy lets go of this rock here, he's pulled back, you all know what will happen. It'll start moving, won't it? So what will happen is this potential energy will become kinetic energy. OK, let's go then and look at the next chart, Linda. Now, here's another one, though. Let's talk about that. This guy up here, is he moving? And the answer is no. He's just standing there. So his velocity is 0. So this guy's kinetic energy is equal to? zero because he's not moving. It's one half mv squared, but v is zero, so this is zero. So his kinetic energy is that. But what happens if he gets on that skateboard and jumps out and goes down here? Now is he moving? Yes. So what happens is this potential energy is changed into kinetic energy. And then what happens is he goes, and I know you guys have all seen this, but he goes up here, starts going slower and slower and slower, and at the top, 
potential energy is back to here because he stops at the top and he does some kind of trick, probably. So you see what happens is gravitational potential energy can be changed into kinetic energy and vice versa. So we have the conservation of energy. So let's go ahead, Linda, to the next one then. Okay. Now um, I'm going to read this, and then we're going to talk a bit about it. So how much more kinetic energy does a car? Okay. Uh, okay. How much more kinetic energy does a 15... 100 kilogram car have when it's traveling at 90 miles per hour and when it's traveling at 70 miles per hour now and this is a multiple choice and Linda let's just go ahead and you know just see um, how people do with this I, I am going to give them just a little bit of time to think about this but everybody look at this it's 90 miles per hour and this is 70 miles per hour this is miles, and that is kilograms. And so you see we have to think about that, and we have to realize that a kilogram, and these are joules, uh, meter squared per second squared. So you see to compare these answers, we have to think about these. So, and if you want to guess, guessing is fine. Uh, in fact, let's just say, uh, think about the problem for a moment and guess. Now here, this is going to be mega joules. That's millions of joules. This is mega joules. This is kilojoules, and this is kilojoules. So D is the, um, so th this one up here, A is definitely the smallest number, and, and so on and so forth. So a car, it's traveling at 90 than when it's traveling at 70. Uh, go ahead and just pick one and we'll see how we do. Go ahead, please. This is just for fun. No one's taking grades or anything like that. Okay, Linda, let's advance the slide and see how we did. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So we need to have do the kinetic energy for this speed, and the kinetic energy for this speed, and just subtract them. Now, before we do that, we have to convert the speeds to standard units. And so what we find when we do that is 90 miles per hour is approximately 40 meters per second. And you see how dimensional analysis comes in. I guarantee you there will be problems dealing with dimensional analysis on the uh, final exam, on the exam over physics. And uh, 70 miles per hour is approximately 31 um, meters per second. So the difference in kinetic energy is you're going the faster speed minus the slower speed is going to be this one. Now they rounded it off. They called 0.48. And I guess they were saying that we only have one significant digit up here. That's the reason they're doing it. They say the answer is C. Now what you really should do is focus down here and make sure you understand that. Are we good or are there questions before we go on? Sounds good, Linda. Let's advance then. So now we've talked a little bit about kinetic energy. Now, uh, your author makes a big deal. I thought this was kind of a curious chart. There was an analogy between energy and uh, money. And so they say money is like energy because it can take multiple forms. And you see some of the multiple forms that it can take. You can transform it from one form to another, potential to kinetic and back and forth. These transformations do not change the total amount of money, though. You can also transfer energy, change the total amount, and it can be stored or it can be spent. 
So uh, maybe that's a useful analogy. Um, and let's look more about the energy then. So Linda, go ahead and go ahead to the next slide, please. Now, we're going to talk about what happens here. Now, we said if you stretched this slingshot, you get elastic potential energy. So you see this has some potential energy. And nothing's happening until um, this um, fellow uh, lets go of this slingshot. But watch what happens when he lets go of the slingshot. Now, he's stretched this back, and then he lets go. So all the potential energy here becomes kinetic energy right here. So you see, and later on we'll have equations for all this stuff. I could give you uh, some conditions here. You could tell me, well, what is the kinetic energy right here? So you see all of the elastic potential energy of the sling was converted to kinetic energy for this rock that is shooting out. But what happens? as V goes up. Well, gravity's pulling it down, isn't it, everybody? So it's slowing down as it's going up. And so what really happens is, as it's going up, the kinetic energy is getting less. And that means that, where does it go? Well, it has more gravitational potential energy. And then, and some of the low, uh, low stakes assessment that we're doing, it's important that you realize that, oh, at this top, the velocity is zero. So that means it's so the kinetic energy was spent here. The elastic potential energy was changed to kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is being changed to potential energy. And at this juncture, you have a greater potential energy. And then the rack, uh, rock starts falling. So the potential ener the kinetic energy, which is zero here, so we change everything to gravitational potential energy, and the rock starts falling. And the gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy of the rock. So you see this is a nice example talking about elastic potential energy, kinetic energy, and gravitational potential energy. Do you understand the concepts or do you have a questions here? Okay, no questions. Linda, let's advance the, uh, the slide, please. Okay, so uh, we're, we're probably finished with this section, actually. So energy can take various forms, and we're going to concentrate on, and this is going to be true in our studies, we're going to concentrate on kinetic, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy, and they're all forms of mechanical energy. Uh, energy in an isolated system is always conserved can be transferred uh, between objects and also transferred into different forms, but the total amount remains the same. Okay, Linda, let's go to the next slide. Now we're going to start talking about a concept that's called work. Now what I was trying to convey to you earlier is I showed you, and I know I showed you once, but I'm going to show you again, energy what came in joules. But we also looked at kinetic energy and realized that this was going to be uh, mass. This is, was going to be, um, or actually, I mean, it is mass. I'm going to call it kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that's the same thing as Newton meter. Now, in this chapter, in this section, we're going to say that Newton meter is a unit of work. So you see, energy is what we're going to call work. So keep that in mind as we go forward. All right, here we go. In everyday usage, work is any activity that requires muscular or mental exertion. Now, by the way, that's in everyday usage. Uh, I might be talking to Linda on the phone, and she said, did you do any work today? And I might say, oh, I really worked hard today. Well, most of my work is sitting at my PC making videos and things like that. And that's mental exertion. But that's not much physical exertion. So in everyday usage, that's what that means. But that's not what it means in physics. Physics have a different definition. 
and it is a force acting on an object and the object undergoes displacement. You see there's force and there's displacement. That's going to be work. And we're going to talk about a theorem called the kinetic energy theory uh, theorem that talks about the relationship between kinetic energy and work. But first, we're going to calculate work in a couple of situations. So, Linda, please advance the slide. And we're watching the time. We're doing fine. Okay. Um, so, here's some work. And remember that work has to do with force. It has to do with distance. But we're going to talk about a couple of examples here. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, let's look at this. The work is the product of the magnitude of a displacement, that's this S, moving this box, and a constant force moving in the direction of S. And notice that F is moving exactly in the direction of S. So it's just going to be the product of those two numbers. But now, and I don't know if this is as good an example as the one I often talk about. In fact, I am going to talk about my grandson over here just for a minute. There's a really good point to this story, though, so please pay attention. My grandson used to like for me to pull him in a wagon. He is a young man now, so, you know, we don't do this anymore. But here's what happened. I was pulling on the tongue of the wagon, so I was pulling up at this direction. Well, the only thing he really cared about that he thought was worthwhile work was motion in the X direction. And you see, since I was pulling it up like that, I also was wasting some energy like this. You see, I was trying to lift that, but that didn't do him any good because he had the need for speed. He wanted to be going that way. So that's what comes up here. And this is the other thing. You see here, you got a car going on. And maybe you're saying that some, um, I'm, I'm trying to even think what happened here. Oh, OK, so the car was going along. Now somebody starts pushing it. But they're pushing it in this direction. Well, as far as the car's concerned, we're, you know, even though they're pushing it, in this direction with that force, what they're really getting is down here this component of force that's called force parallel. That's what those two little bars mean. So the force parallel is force times the cosine of this angle. And you see, just as my grandson thought I was wasting this, this guy is also wasting the perpendicular component of his effort because that's not going to be in the direction that the car's going. And so, uh, and you could think about somebody steering the car too, but he's shoving at an angle. So that means that whoever's steering the car, they're only getting this. So this is an important concept. Work done by a constant force, a straight line displacement is, you see that's F parallel. So that's F times the cosine of the angle times S. But Linda knows what the cosine of zero is. And the cosine of zero, she would tell you is one. So you see, if you're pushing in exactly the same direction, it results in the same kind of thing. So the takeaway from this slide is that uh, the work is always going to be the force parallel times the displacement. So you have to really talk about the force in that direction. Linda, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the definition of work then. So now I told you we we're going to define work and you'll see it here now. Okay, so the definition of work. If an object undergoes a straight line displacement S, while a constant force, the vector F, is acting on the object, then the work done by the force on the object is this. This is the work. So you see the work is the force parallel in the direction of S. So we do have to use that trig if this is happening at an angle. And this F parallel is the component of F in the direction of the displacement. And usually it's going to be uh, F times cosine of the angle. Okay. And again, the units of this are going to be joules. 
and are going to be Newton meters. Okay, Linda, can we go to the uh, next slide, please? Uh, and I think that's uh, well, let's just look at these things there. So uh, work again, I already said it's a scalar quantity. Uh, if an object doesn't move, the displacement is zero, so that's zero. If you're perpendicular to the motion, then uh, of the force and the work's equal to zero. Let's suppose I gave Linda a whole bunch of books. This is my crude picture of Linda. So I gave her a whole bunch of books and she, you know, is carrying them along. And Linda is walking at a constant velocity this way. So she's walking straight. She's got those books. Now the force on those books is going to be going down here. So if so, it's the mass of the books times gravity, but it's going down here. Now if you look at that, you can say, oh, but that is perpendicular to Linda's motion. So you see from a physics point of view, even if Linda walked a mile at this constant velocity carrying those books, from a physics point of view, there was no work done because she's not walking with an opposition force. Uh, and you see this force is perpendicular to her motion, and that's what we talked about. Okay, Linda, let's uh, advance the slide one more time, please. Okay, now this is a problem talking about pushing a uh, stalled car, and I think we'll be able to finish this problem. So here's an example of how we calculate the work done by pushing a force. And all these, you can, should consider these as Example problems that someday I might ask you, either on a low stakes assessment or uh, or otherwise. So Steve pushes his st stalled car and he pushed it 19 meters to clear the intersection. So for some reason he ran out of gas or something, so he shoves it and he shoved it 19 meters, which is uh, almost 60 feet. Now he pushes with a constant force of 210 newtons. Now, how much work does he do on the car if he pushes it in the direction the car is heading? And B, if he pushes it at 30 degrees to that direction. So you see the car is here, and let's suppose that the car was heading this way, but he's pushing at 30 degrees there. And I hope you're looking at this and saying, well, he's wasting some things because that's worthwhile. But this part isn't. And that's what this problem is going to be about. Okay, so let's do part A. So he pushes with a force of 210 newtons in the direction of the car. And he does for 19 meters. Well, uh, so when Steve pushes in the direction of the car, this angle is zero. And you can plug that into your calculator. The cosine of phi is equal to 1. Okay, so the work is going to be, we take 210 newtons times 19 meters, and we get uh, 4.0 times 10 cubed joules. Now notice that this is a newton meter, and a newton meter is a joule. But now part B, you see he's not pushing in the direction. So a lot of his work, at least this part of his work, uh, of his force is being wasted. So in this case, the angle is 30 degrees. You can plug 30 degrees and find the cosine into your calculator and get that. So we're going to find that the work here is uh, 210 newtons. That was the force that he was pushing with. Now it is the cosine of the angle, and then it's times S. You do all that multiplies, you get this. So you see, he does um, more work up here than he did down here. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's advance the slide, Linda. And actually, part thirteen, Linda. I think we're going to do a. Um, we're going to do a poll right now 
and uh, ask the students how they feel about, um, oh, I guess, you know, um, do, doing more problems, giving them time to work on it. Or maybe you want to just say about the opening exercise or something. And I, I just, um, you know, sort of thumbs up or thumbs down. More opening exercises, yes or no. Well, Linda, maybe it's a little pre uh, premature, but I think um, I think they um, liked that, so I think we'll do that again. Um, you know, because uh, people thought it was uh, useful. I guess they got value in in doing this. Okay, what I'm going to be doing now is I am going to be having office hours soon. Uh, Linda, if you could. Uh, hang around and or let's see maybe Linda the thing uh, w would you mind calling me just for a short time after this sure I can do that and, and I won't keep you long uh, and uh, so anyway you've got a low stakes assessment due one week from today uh, it is in the in the video and I'm going to pick this up um, you know with uh, with some more videos and I will see you guys again Thursday now an important thing to remember is this is not easy um, we can post LSA 12. It is in the uh, it is in the in the video, but we'll we'll take a picture of that and post that uh, so that you have it. And I guess um, I guess that's pretty much it for uh, for tonight. Everybody, take care of yourselves. And Linda, if you can give me a call, that would be good. And let's just stop recording. Okay.